Day 12. Murphy's Law says that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Now, that dates back to an engineering meeting in 1877. But another pretty cool early variant of that is magician Neville Maskelyne's note from 1908 on the difficulty of performing magic tricks. It is an experience common to all men to find that, on any special occasion, such as the production of a magical effect for the first time in public, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. In October 1962, both the US and the USSR are trying magic tricks involving nuclear weapons on a massive scale, and on the 27th of October, it seems like almost everything that can go wrong does go wrong. This is Time Ghost with the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm Indy Nidell. Yesterday, Chairman of the Soviet Council of Ministers Nikita Khrushchev offered the U.S. an olive branch in the form of a trade-off, removing Soviet nuclear missiles from Cuba for guaranteed sovereignty of Cuba. American President John F. Kennedy was once again seriously considering invading Cuba, and near the American naval blockade line around the island, two Soviet nuclear-armed submarines were forced to surface and surrender to the U.S. Navy after their batteries ran out. The Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Presidium wake up to some alarming telegrams from Cuba, sent by Ambassador Alexeyev to Khrushchev and Defense Minister Marshal Malinovsky. In F. Castro's opinion, the intervention is almost inevitable and will occur in approximately 24 to 72 hours. Castro demands that the Soviets make clear to the U.S. that the missiles belong to them and not the Cubans, to hopefully deter the U.S. from invading. But he also demands that the Soviets make public their alliance with Cuba, which they have not done. He seems to be wavering somewhere between morbid panic and suicidal euphoria. The Czechoslovakian ambassador reports, If Soviet Ambassador Alexeyev confirms this information during the night hours, we will give the order to burn all classified materials except for the enciphered data, which we will destroy last. At the same time, I will order the emergency measures for informing and organizing our citizens as per the emergency plan. The Chinese embassy reports, Castro is firm. Even if Cuba were to be wiped out by a possible nuclear war, as Castro said, imperialism would be closer to facing its demise and global socialism would arrive sooner. The Presidium is also in disarray. As they meet this morning, Khrushchev starts out by wondering if this whole thing wasn't maybe a mistake after all. They decide to revisit that issue at a later date. They have also received word from UN General Secretary U Tant that they need to publicly acknowledge the existence of the missiles to not further worsen the situation. They decide to make a public statement admitting that the missiles are there and they will remove them if the U.S. removes its missiles in Turkey and Pakistan. Khrushchev leaves the meeting to dictate the public letter, which will first be transmitted to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and to Utant. Malinovsky immediately telegraphs orders to Agricultural Specialist Pavlov, aka General Pliev, to dial back his troop activities on Cuba and show restraint. Stop all work on deployment of R-12 and R-14. You are aggravating the United Nations. Camouflage everything carefully. Work only at night. We categorically confirm that you are prohibited from using nuclear weapons from missiles, FKR, Luna, and aircraft without orders from Moscow. Meanwhile in the White House, XCOM is meeting with the President again to find a response to the latest developments. They talk about intercepts and surveillance missions when President Kennedy receives a new cable, he reads it aloud. Premier Khrushchev told President Kennedy yesterday to withdraw offensive weapons from Cuba if the United States would do its rockets from Turkey. Mm -hmm. That's how he's read by both of the associations that have put it out so far. The Reuters said the same thing. He did. He didn't really say that, did he? No. He may not be he he putting out another letter. Another paper. What is our, uh, well, our, uh, but anyway, they got this clear about how they, uh, let's just uh, go on then. Are you finished in a second? We want to tell hey, you about the, uh, the, what? Pierre? Pierre. That wasn't in the letter we received, was it? Uh, no. I read it pretty carefully. read that way. Well, therefore, is he putting, supposedly putting out a letter he's written me or putting out a statement? We had a letter he wrote to you. 
The confusion is total. Later, Defense Secretary McNamara complains. Now, remember that those missiles in Turkey are obsolete and scheduled to be dismantled anyway, as are those in Pakistan, but no one's taking notice of that part of the offer. It's not as important, you see. The problem is that they don't want to get any of their NATO allies upset by giving them the feeling that they're hanging them out to dry. Pakistan is not a NATO ally. They take a break. McNamara heads off to the Pentagon and President Kennedy goes back to the residence. At 11.45, McNamara calls from the Pentagon. They have a new problem. A U-2 spy plane has gone missing over Alaska and flown into Russian airspace. The flight has nothing whatsoever to do with the crisis. It's supposed to be a routine flight to measure lingering radioactive fallout over the North Pole after the thermonuclear test over Nova Zemlya, which we mentioned in day zero. Despite this being a super modern airplane, in 1962, there's no GPS and radar navigation is not possible over the North Pole. Instead, the U-2s pilot by using the stars the same way Magellan and Columbus did. The pilot of this particular U-2 has gotten confused by an unusual amount of northern lights and is now a thousand miles off course, 300 miles into Russian airspace. Also remember that U.S. Strategic Air Command is still at DEFCON 2, the defense readiness stage right before imminent nuclear war. To make the situation worse, the Russians have scrambled MiG fighter jets to shoot down the U-2. In response, instead of informing the White House, Air Command have scrambled their F-102 fighter jets to protect the U-2. One of those jets is armed only with a tactical nuclear missile. But since this is the gift that keeps on giving, there's more. Instead of interrupting all upcoming flights, Air Command has let the next scheduled U-2 go up over the North Pole for its flight. Only after 90 minutes have passed do they get the idea of informing the Pentagon, who immediately inform McNamara. McNamara is understandably furious. What if the Soviets misunderstand all of this as the initiation of nuclear war? What if the F-102 pilot fires his nuclear missile by mistake? President Kennedy is notably cooler when he's informed, reportedly wryly muttering, there's always some son of a bitch who doesn't get the word. In the end, the pilot of the U-2 runs out of fuel, but glides back into US airspace and ditches his plane on a private airfield, coming out unscathed, but deeply shaken. Kennedy goes back to the XCOM meeting to discuss what to do about invasion plans and which letter from Khrushchev to respond to. It doesn't take long for another worrying message regarding another U-2 mission to come in. This time it is relevant to the crisis though. A U-2 piloted by Major Rudolph Anderson Jr., one of the most experienced U-2 pilots, has gone missing. Now things are getting too hot, so they decide they can't wait for a decision on how to deal with their NATO allies regarding the missiles in Turkey. Instead, they decide to ignore the Khrushchev letter from today and reply to the letter from yesterday and accept guaranteeing the territorial integrity of Cuba in exchange for a monitored withdrawal of the missiles. They then start to look at when they have to take military action in case the Soviets don't accept the deal. Low altitude flights have revealed that the Cuban surface to air missile sites are being taken over by Soviet troops and they are much more disciplined than the revolutionary forces of Cuba. In fact, all of the flybys today have had flak fired at them from much closer than any day so far. There is a sense of urgency from the Joint Chiefs of Staff to strike now. What is the rush about this? Oh, the fact what? that we have to make the strike. I think the rush is what do we do? Yeah. Oh, the YouTube. The YouTube was shot down. The uh, fire against our low altitude surveillance. shut down. Yeah, Rogers just said it was found shut down. Pilot killed. Thursday, but 
Tuesday and take time to go to NATO. And How do we explain the effect of uh, this Khrushchev message last night with their decision, in view of their previous orders, the change in orders, we both had flat and a SAM side operator. How do we, uh, I mean, that must be... How do we interpret this? I, I don't know. He's killing the interview. While drafting the letter to Khrushchev, the conversation keeps returning to airstrikes and invasion. Off and on, there are expressions of shock and incredulity that the Soviets have actually shot down a U.S. plane. It seems that the reality of the situation is finally sinking in. Thing is, that's the same sentiment that exists on the Soviet side. Although the commander of Operation Anadir, General Pliev, was acting as ordered when he shot down the U-2, and Malinovsky knows this, he will soon cable him. We believe that you were too hasty in shooting down the US U-2 reconnaissance plane. At the time, an agreement was emerging to avert, by peaceful means, an attack on Cuba. In the recording of the XCOM meeting, the Kennedy brothers both leave the room at about the same time. It is believed that this is the moment when they privately agree that Robert Kennedy will meet Soviet ambassador to the US Dobrynin that same evening and propose a secret deal to remove the Turkish missiles to resolve the crisis. The conditions are that this deal never becomes public, that the Americans get five months to do it, and it's based solely on JFK's word of honor. When RFK meets with Dobrynin at 7.15 p.m., Dobrynin will report back that Bobby Kennedy looked dead tired, like someone who had not slept for a long, long time. Before that, at XCOM, President Kennedy sums up his feelings about any further steps toward invasion at this point. It's not very well in danger that Cuba with all its toil and blood is going to be, uh, when you could have gotten them out by making a deal on the same business on Turkey, and that part of the record would have been a very good war. What neither the Americans nor the Soviets know, and many of them will never know, is that while all this political talk is going on, on board Soviet submarine B-59 in the Caribbean on this very day, someone is actually about to fire a nuclear weapon to launch Armageddon. Join us tomorrow on day 13 when we conclude this series and see exactly how close the world came to total destruction. And click subscribe to never miss our content. Good night and good luck.